Welcome to Christ Church. I'm Paul Gardner. I'm the senior minister here, and it's a, a huge joy to welcome back RZIM for another event in this church. Uh, we're looking forward to it very greatly this evening. Uh, like you, I'm sure you've come looking forward to uh, a challenging, scintillating evening. Um, as you can probably detect, my background is not Atlantan. Um, <laughs> And therefore, when I say welcome, whatever your background and uh, uh, wherever you come from, I really mean it <laughs> because uh, uh, we just enjoy welcoming people from all sorts of different backgrounds in this church and uh, are glad you're here today. Uh, I want to say a thank you too because I won't get another chance to do so to the RZIM team who have put on this evening and uh, this event, and just a big thank you from all of us to you guys, wherever you are, and in the back over here at the moment. And that lets me introduce Cameron McAllister to you, who is our MC for this evening from RZIM. So, uh, Alistair, do come on. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is so good to see all of you, and we are delighted that you're here. The topic under discussion this evening is obviously a very timely one, and I don't think I need to remind anybody in this room of the urgency of what we're talking about. And we see a lot of news, we see, we see words in the media that paint the urgency of the issue, and it's in many ways garnered a polarized response. We, pe we hear people talking about extreme actions. We hear, we hear reference to groups like Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, ISIS, ISIL, and many people are saying that, of course, this represents all of Islam. Others are saying this has nothing to do with Islam or religion at all. These people do not speak for Muslims. And so the response is a polarized response, and it raises a lot of questions. But these are questions that we can't avoid because they affect each and every one of us. And that's why the book that Dr. Qureshi has written, Answering Jihad, is a very timely book. And just seeing all of you here tonight is a real encouragement. Just a few words on the format and then I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Qureshi will speak for about 30 minutes because he wants to allow as much time for Q&A as possible and then we'll take your questions. Let me give you a few words about my friend and colleague, Dr. Nabil Qureshi. Nabil was born into a devoutly Muslim family, and before Nabil was a Christian apologist, he was a Muslim apologist. And he used to have some very good questions for Christians as well. And his journey from Islam to Christianity has been chronicled in the book Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, and many of you have probably read that book, and it's a New York Times bestseller at this point. Let's name some other credentials here. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus was also awarded the Christian Book Award for the categories of Best New Author and Best Nonfiction of 2015. And then Christianity Today heralded Dr. Qureshi as one of 33 under 33. He's gonna pass that mark pretty soon. Now, Dr. Qureshi has also lectured to students at more than 100 universities, and these universities include Oxford, Columbia, Dartmouth, Cornell University. I was there for that one, so I can vouch for the authenticity of that one. Johns Hopkins, University of Hong Kong. And now here are his academic credentials. Here's a little bit of Dr. Qureshi's background. He holds an MD from Eastern Virginia Medical School an MA in Christian Apologetics from Biola University, and an MA in Religion from Duke University. But that wasn't enough for Dr. Qureshi. So he's currently studying Judaism and Christianity at Oxford and pursuing his doctorate in New Testament studies. So the man is truly a glutton for punishment. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and my great privilege to introduce to you today my colleague and my friend, Dr. Nabil Qureshi. Give me 
expect Cameron to be giving away my age. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you here. I, it really was just a few months ago that I felt led to write this book. It, it, this was a leading, it was a calling. And so I wanted to thank you because we didn't decide to do this event until about two weeks ago. <laughs> So thank you so much for coming out. I wanted to thank the church for hosting tonight. I want to thank uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries for uh, making the world turn in order for this to happen. Um, this is really a crucial topic. This is really a crucial matter. Let me give you a little bit of uh, background on why uh, I wrote this book. Actually, first let's start with prayer, and then I'll give you background on why I wrote this book. So let's, let's turn to the Lord. God, you must feel your heart breaking at the way your creation is destroying itself. Every single body, every single heart, every single mind is miraculous in so many ways. and not just a conglomeration of cells, but you then infuse them with your image, Lord. Every single person here on this earth is made in your image, albeit broken. And you love us, God, and yet we stand by and watch as either we, ourselves, or others around us destroy the people you love. Lord God, I pray that Tonight would not be about just scratching an academic itch or, or trying to learn how to better protect ourselves out of fear of what's going on, but rather, God, I pray that we would have your heart, that as long as this world is broken, Lord, our hearts would be broken for it, and that the 4.6 million displaced people from one country alone wouldn't be something that would be on the periphery of our radar, but something, Lord, that we would pray for day in and day out, if not do more for. God, I pray that you would make this about you. We so easily get distracted, God. May we be yours, and if we claim to be yours, God, please take our hearts and take our minds. And in this presentation tonight, Lord, I pray that you would speak. I pray it would be about your glory and reaching out to your people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So I'll tell you what happened. I was uh, in England. Uh, as Cameron said, I'm currently studying in England, uh, working on my doctorate in New Testament studies. Um, currently, I'm in the, the portion just before that, working on Jewish and Christian studies. And uh, I was just about to come back to the States. There's a conference every year called uh, uh, Evangelical Theological Society and the Society of Biblical Literature that meets every November. And so I was just about to come back. And Michelle had just finished, my wife had just finished packing her suitcase and we were planning on you know, having our passports ready to go in the morning, literally just about to head out the door. When I turned on Twitter, as I'm wont to do, and I saw that Paris was under attack and people had no idea what was going on. It was in the midst of the attack itself. Didn't know how many shooters there were, didn't know where it was happening. It seemed to be happening throughout the city of Paris. Uh, people at first were very hesitant to say that it was Muslims, but other people who were more ready to judge based on previous circumstances said this has got to be Muslims. It was in the middle of all that that it reminded me very much of the fear that had happened around the, uh, the July 7th bombings in England. I don't know how many of you recall that. We are on this side of the pond, so we might have missed that. But it was one of those where everyday life had just come to a complete and utter stop. And we realized for a moment the reality that there are people out there who are willing to kill those of us who've done nothing ostensibly wrong to them. But in their perspective, something has been done to them. How are we supposed to understand them? And immediately the rhetoric started going, these people are, are just evil, they just want to kill for the sake of killing. Whereas anybody who has studied the way wars work, the way violence occurs, dehumanizing them is the thing that we automatically do. We don't try to understand their perspective. We just see them as enemies who are killing us. And that's immediately what we did, and we do that over and over again. And as a result of that, when the dust settles, 
And when people are trying to put the pieces together and say, what is it that just happened? What we do is we say those killers were inhuman. What they did makes no sense. And as Francois Holland said, clearly they can't be Muslim because Islam is a religion of peace. Now, the heart behind what he said is something that I resonated with. Because what is he trying to do by saying that? What he's trying to do, we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. What he's trying to do is preserve order for his country. He's trying to preserve backlash from happening to his own French citizens who happen to be Muslims. That's why he's saying what he's saying. But is it true? In that moment, we tend to agree with such things or at least let them slide because we, we want to restore a, a, an idea of order in the community. And so we, we kind of just, those of us who disagree say fine, and those of us who, who are on board, we say, yes, you're right, Islam is a religion of peace, and we move on. But what was very different about this event was what happened shortly after, less than a few weeks later. By that point, uh, I was celebrating Thanksgiving with my in-laws. Uh, I was in North Carolina, and uh, we weren't going to be able to be there for Christmas, so my wife and I called it our Thanksmas celebration. And so we're eating dinner, and what should happen again on Twitter? I get the message that San Bernardino is now under attack. And once again, there's a lot of hesitance to say who it might be that's doing this, but it has all the marks of Islamic extremism. But we can't say Islamic extremism, so it has all the marks of terrorists who are doing this. Something different happened in the beginning of December. Mid-November, it was Islam's religion of peace and that, and that language was, was permeating kind of the media discussion. But this time, the memory was still very raw. The nerve was still touched from Paris. And now it had happened in San Bernardino and people didn't want any of the rhetoric. They wanted to say, what is going on here? Why are these people killing us? And in this case, there was a husband and a wife. The wife had just left their child how could someone leave a child in this world to grow up on their own and then go kill innocent people? In the West, we're reeling with these questions, and now this time, the rhetoric of Islam as a religion of peace did not work. And in that moment, I felt very much the same way that I felt after 9-11. Now understand, in 9-11, I was a Muslim. I became a Christian in 2005, but I still look the way I do. My name is still <laughs> Nabil Qureshi. And so when, when people have this anti-Islamic sentiment that is kind of permeating the air, even though I'm a Christian minister, that affects me and it affects my family. And so I still feel it. But particularly I was getting concerned about my family because my mom wears the hijab, she wears a burqa, my sister wears a burqa whenever she goes out. How are people gonna treat them based on what just happened in California? And so not only is the issue about what is going on not clearly being addressed. Not only is the relationship of Islam to violence not being discussed, which is in itself dangerous because if we don't address the issue, we leave our country vulnerable to more attacks. If we don't address the problem, more can happen. But at the same time, we've got innocent people who are in the crosshairs, how do we protect their lives? And they're often saying that Islam is a religion of peace and they're not saying that for rhetorical purposes, they mean it. How do we explain this? And in the midst of that moment, I was waiting for a voice to clarify. I was waiting for someone to come in and to say what needed to be said. Trust me, I did not want to be that person. <laughs> because number one, anytime you say anything about these matters, people wonder what your, your actual motivations are. Are you trying to capitalize off tragedy? Oh, you wrote a book about jihad. You're just trying to make money at this time, aren't you? I didn't want to deal with that. I also didn't want to deal with the fact that this is a very volatile topic, and what I really feel called to do is to share the gospel. I feel like the gospel message is the one that will change this world, and I don't think anything else really will. I think everything else is a temporary bomb or salve, but the gospel message is the one that will address this world's ails, and that's what I want to share. But in this moment, there was neither clarity nor charity. People were pointing the finger at one another. It was becoming very polar. And we saw what had happened with some of the political candidates who were saying things about Muslims that then just got inflamed in the media. Should we let refugees in or not? Can a Muslim become president of the United States or not? 
Should we have a database of all the refugees who are here, where they live, etc.? These were ideas that were being kind of aired on the political scene, and it was all about rhetoric on both sides. No one was actually dealing with the issues. Then when the Wheaton controversy happened, how many of you remember the Wheaton controversy when all of a sudden you have a Wheaton professor who wishes to stand up in solidarity with Muslims? She wears a hijab and she says that Islam is, uh, where Muslims worship the same God that Christians worship and therefore I stand in solidarity with them, to paraphrase her. By the way, I had in the past uh, counseled many women who reach out to Muslim women to feel free to wear a hijab if they want, as long as it's clear that they're Christians and they're doing so out of respect and not out of subjugation or not out of any, any felt need to have to do that, as long as they, they're clear that they're doing it out of love, Christian love, then I say, it's fine, go ahead and do it. So I wasn't against Dr. Hawkins uh, saying, uh, wearing a hijab or anything like that. But then the question became a real one, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Now, full disclosure, for seven years after I had become a Christian, I had one position on that, and then for the last three years, I have a different position on that. And so I'm seeing people point the finger at one another, accuse each other of heresy, when I'm thinking, this is more complicated than, than you might realize. And yet people in this kind of very politically polar climate are doing exactly what the media is doing, and they're just dividing themselves and not listening with clarity or charity. So that's what I then decided to do. I decided to address the issue of do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And what I found out was, after I wrote what I thought was a very basic response, I received hundreds of comments saying, thank you so much for sharing this. We were looking for this information. Uh, I hadn't taken a vacation all year. I had set aside three weeks for the end of the year uh, to take some vacation. And the Lord said, Nabil, that time has been set aside for a purpose. You need to write this book. And I said, Lord, are you talking to somebody near me? <laughs> are you talking to me? Uh, and I had a battle with him on that one. But I really felt called to write this book. Because right now, like I said, you have people on one side of the spectrum, on the far left, uh, who tend to show a lot of compassion towards Muslims, and I appreciate that. But they're willing to do so at the cost of the truth. They're willing to, to say that none of these terrorists have anything to do with Islam because Islam is a religion of peace. And again, compassion is the driving force that's making them say that, but do we do that by ignoring 14 centuries of the history of Islam, consensuses of Islamic theology on jihad? Do we ignore all that for compassion's sake? And then we have people on the far right who are willing to point out that Islam might not be a religion of, of peace, but they were doing so without any compassion whatsoever for Muslims. They were treating all Muslims as latent threats. And that includes my mom and my sister. So at that point, I really prayed and felt led to write Answering Jihad. Here's the point of the book. The point of the book is to get to the truth without compromising compassion. And to share how we can actually respond, how we can answer Jihad through compassion without compromising the truth. That's the point. It's really hard to hold that intention these days. People don't want you to, to be even-handed. They want you to be on one side or the other. But we, especially those of us who are Christians, need to hold the truth in tension with compassion because that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what he calls us to do. So just to go back a little bit, I mentioned 9-11 very briefly. 9-11 was a turning point in my life. I was raised as a Muslim in the United States from the Ahmadi sect of Islam. And growing up, my parents had taught me that Islam was a religion of peace. So this wasn't something that I just said to others and made it up. It was what was taught to me. I was taught that Allah is absolutely the one true God, that he is monadic, that there's no division within him. There's no such thing as Allah being a father or a son. He's one God. Christians, they have, they have turned their faith into into this polytheistic idea of a trinity. They're wrong, Islam is true. We glorify Allah because he is monadic. And so we ought to share the truth of Islam with others. And in so doing then, we need to represent Islam with grace. My mom had taught me that in order to be a compelling Muslim, I was an ambassador for Islam. Just because I, 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 I looked Muslim and my name is Muslim, people would see me and they would immediately say, this guy's a Muslim. And so anything I did would reflect on Islam because they're seeing me as a Muslim. 
So my mother would say to me, Nabil, you have to be the most respectful person. If a, if a woman walks past you, make sure you lower your gaze in respect and don't, don't stare at her as she walks by. If someone is lying around you, make sure that you stand up for the truth. If they're pressuring you to lie, stand up for the truth. Take care of people who are oppressed. These are the things my mother taught me in the name of Islam. And at the same time, my father was in the military. He was in the U.S. Navy. So growing up, I saw my father go out to sea and defend our country for months at a time. And he taught me that being a good Muslim also meant being willing to be a good citizen and to fight for the country that's defending you. That's what my father taught me as a Muslim at the same time as they taught me to love Islam. So for me, that's what Islam was like growing up. So when I told people Islam's a religion of peace, it wasn't rhetoric. It's what I actually believed. And when the Muslims around me said Islam is a religion of peace, they actually believed it too. And these verses about jihad and whatnot in the Quran, we hadn't actually studied them. When we recited the Quran, we recited it in Arabic, but the vast majority of us didn't know what Arabic meant. We knew how to recite the words, but we didn't know how to understand it. And so we would just recite the Arabic scripture of the Quran not knowing what the words actually said. So we didn't actually deal with the passages on jihad. Not until 9-11. When the Twin Towers were attacked, I honestly think that American Muslims who were like me, the ones who loved this country and the ones who loved their faith, were the most devastated out of all Americans on 9-11 apart from those who lost family members, of course. Because we felt the vulnerability that every other American felt too. We had lived in that safety bubble up until September 2001, and we thought we were safe, but now there were Muslims in those, in those Twin Towers who were killed. We could have been them. So we felt vulnerable too. But at the same time, we had to start responding to questions from, from non-Muslims saying, how do you defend this? How do you understand Islam? Is Islam a religion of peace? And all of a sudden, we're on the back foot trying to explain that, yes, Islam is a religion of peace. And so we're outwardly having to defend our faith. But I'm telling you, inwardly, we were asking questions as well, at least those who were in the same position I was. We had been taught Islam was a religion of peace, and so that's what we were telling people. At the mosque that I attended, we had been told to say this. We were actually taught what to say in response, that the hijackers who took that plane also took the Islamic faith. Not only did they hijack those planes, they hijacked the Islamic faith. Islam is a religion of peace, and what you're seeing in the media is what is a result of some terrorists who have nothing to do with Islam. That's what we were taught in the mosque. But I had a friend who wouldn't let me get away with slogans. I met him just a few weeks before 9-11, um, and we became friends during that time. And it was at that time when he would say, Nabil, you keep telling me Islam's a religion of peace, but how do you explain what these guys are doing? And I would say, oh, well, what they're doing has nothing to do with Islam. He'd say, really, what do you do with these Quranic verses? And he'd translate them for me in English, and he'd say, how do you handle this? And it would be my first time seeing those verses. And in that moment, I would just say whatever I had to say to get him off my case, right? I would just come up with some kind of response. It was defense, and I just... But then when I was by myself, internally, I'd start researching those things. Is it possible that Muhammad actually said this? Is it possible that the Quran actually teaches this? Can't be true. And then I'd go to the imam of my mosque, or I'd ask my parents, or I'd start searching books to give me answers on what this verse could possibly mean, given that I've been taught Islam as religion of peace. And there would always be some kind of answer that would be given, always some kind of reason to clarify, or some kind of way to deny the, the traditions. But over time, I realized that there were not one, or two, or five, or ten problematic verses and stories. There were hundreds. And I'm talking, this took years. After the course of about three years, I realized that Islam has, at its very core, violent teachings. Tremendously violent teachings. And it was that realization that drove me to a decision point. Now let me give you some examples, because some of you who might be watching, or some of you who are here right now, might not know these things. 
But when I was raised as a Muslim, I was taught that Muhammad was the most perfect man who ever lived. You have to understand the way Muslims grow up with this story of who Muhammad is. He was the greatest general. He was the greatest diplomat. He was the greatest father, the greatest husband. He was the monotheist in the city of pagans who would worship one God even though nobody else did. And God chose him to reveal the final message to all mankind. He was extremely merciful, as we were taught as Muslims, that when he finally could take revenge on a whole city that had induced the murder of his uncle, that had ultimately led to the death of his wife, when all those people, he could have killed them, in that moment he decided to give them all mercy, even though they were responsible for the death of his loved ones. That's how merciful Muhammad is. So these were the stories I was taught from a young age as a Muslim. And I'll tell you this, those stories are found in the Islamic tradition. They weren't being made up. Fast forward 20 years of hearing these stories, you think Muhammad is, is the most perfect man who ever lived. That's why so many people, that's part of the reason why so many people are willing to, to fight and die for the sake of their prophet. Because he represents them and he is the greatest man who ever lived in their eyes. But what happened on 9-11 was I was forced not to just hear the stories that were being told about Muhammad, not to just hear the modern biographies and what my parents had taught me, but I was forced to go back to the Quran, to the Quran's verses, and also to the original biographies on Muhammad's life, including the ones that Muslims give the most weight to. They're called the hadith, the traditions on Muhammad's life. If you know Muslims who live devoutly, how, uh, let me just toss this out to you. How many times a day do Muslims pray? Five. Of course, the five daily prayers, there's additional prayers as well. Does the Quran teach Muslims to pray five times a day? No, it doesn't. Nowhere in the Quran does it say pray five times a day. The proclamation to make someone a Muslim is the shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It's, it's the most common phrase that Muslims recite because it's what you need to say in order to become a Muslim and Muslims believe that you should be reciting that in the moment you die to be ushered into heaven. Nowhere in the Quran is that slogan found. All the rules on on how to pray the five daily prayers, on exactly what to do during the, the pilgrimage. None of that's found in the Quran. The details are all found in the Hadith. So they're in a very important part of Islamic life. But Muslims, again, don't generally read them themselves. They're told stories from their imams. They're told stories from their leaders uh, and from their families. What I did was I went to those stories myself. And by the way, I'm not alone in that because something was happening in that time. They invented a website called Google. <laughs> and it became very easy to start looking these things up yourself. Just five years before that, it was not easy at all. So I started looking these things up. I started studying Muhammad's life. And what I found was that the stories that I had been told about Muhammad were a very, very partial picture. Turns out that Muhammad had done things like torture people for money. Turns out he had punched his wife in the chest, according to Sahih Muslim. Turns out that his man wanted to be able to have intercourse with female slaves and then sell them whether or not they were pregnant. And Muhammad allowed that. In fact, chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran allows that. I start finding these things. I slowly start uncovering them. I find out that Muhammad beheaded anywhere from 400 to 800 men in one single day, men who had surrendered. Some of these men were actually pubescent boys who had just turned 13 or 14. Muhammad's men ordered them to drop their trousers, and if they had any pubic hair, he would behead them. Where have we heard that happen recently? In Syria. All these stories I started seeing. My parents hadn't told me any of these. My friends, I would take them to my Muslim friends and I'd say, hey, what do you do with this? They're like, Nabil, I, we don't know. We've never seen this before. And I'd go to the imams. And again, time after time after time, they tried to explain it away. But after about 100 or 200 of these, I said, look, if we keep denying the parts that we don't want to accept, how can we trust the parts we do accept? What razor are we using to dissect between a peaceful and violent Muhammad except cherry picking? And it was that point that I realized that perhaps the Muhammad I had inherited wasn't the true one. And when I began to study, what I found out was this. This is the reality of Muhammad's life and the Quran according to the traditions. That's a very important set of words there. According to the traditions, this is the reality. 
Muhammad in 610 AD claims to be a prophet. From 610 for the next 13 years, he gets about 100 followers when he's preaching a message of peace. He's preaching a message of taking care of widows and orphans and worshiping one God, of coexisting with Jews and Christians and Sabians. For about 13 years, this is the message he's preaching, and he gets about 100 followers. Some of them are persecuted. A few of them are actually killed. During that time, though, he is peaceful, and he tells his people to be at peace. But then he goes to another city. And in that city, when he flees, and by the way, that's the changing point for the Islamic calendar. That's their AD and BC moment, when he flees to the city. When he goes there, he's immediately given rule over the city. And now he has people who can fight for him. And that very year, he starts launching raids on caravans. One of those raids ultimately becomes the first major battles that becomes the first major battle that Muslims fight. And then for the next 9 years of his life before he dies, he either personally participates in or deputizes 86 battles. It's more than 9 per year until he dies. So you go from peaceful to violence and right before he dies, he composes, or according to Muslims, it was revealed the last major chapter of the Quran. Okay, so I want you to follow this chronology. 610 AD is when the Quran starts coming and he starts preaching Islam. 632 AD is when he dies and the Quran is over. The last major chapter of the Quran is chapter 9. It's not, in chron it's not in order. The Quran's not in chronological order. So chapter 9 is the last chronologically, but it's in, towards the beginning of the Quran. It is by far the most violent book of the Quran, by far. This is the one that says, slay the infidels wherever you find them, lay siege to them and take them captive. This is the one that says, fight Jews and Christians until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel subdued. This is the one in chapter 9, verse 33, which says that Islam is meant to dominate all other religions. This is the one that promises Muslims who die in battle, chapter 9, verse 111, that if you die, you will go to heaven. The verse of the bargain. These are the final marching orders of Islam. Because shortly thereafter, Muhammad dies, and this is the last major chapter of the Quran to be given. This teaching launched Muslims into an unlimited series of battles. What do I mean by unlimited? I mean Muhammad didn't give them clear limits. He didn't say stop fighting these people at this time or once you've accomplished X, stop fighting. There were no limits such as this. Kind of like in the gospel where it says preach the gospel till the ends of the earth. There's no limit at that point. Same way here. There was no limit to the violence. And for that reason, Muslims conquered within 150 years one-third of the known world. Get, I mean, you have to picture this. From the shores of the Atlantic to the valleys of India, one-third of the known world within 150 years. Why? This was the perfect storm of teachings which launched them into this warfare campaign. That is the truth from the Islamic sources. Now, what we find is Muslims have never shied away from this. It was never an issue until the 20th century, up until the, at least toward the end of the 19th century when the Ottoman Empire began to wane, it was at that point that people started saying otherwise. But up until then, Islam's dominance was not anything that Muslims shied away from. Really, it was at the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the end of World War I, where Muslims began to ask questions like, what should we be? What should our identity be? Now that we have really no global power, what should our identity be? Some Muslims started responding by saying, well, Islam is actually a religion of peace. And that slogan first was uttered in the 20th century. At least as far as the records share. Other Muslims, however, started responding in the other way. They started asking questions like, Allah promised us that we would be dominant. Allah promised us that we would have reign. What happened? And the question was answered by saying, we have fallen away from Allah. We have fallen away from what he has told us to do. One man in particular who was thinking along these lines is named Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid Qutb was an intellectual from Egypt. In fact, he went and studied in Colorado for a time. And he saw the way Americans lived. To him, it was very debauched. It was very carnal. 
not refined whatsoever. The music was unrefined. The comedy was unrefined to him. It was, it was just a, a, a very um, ungodly society. So he comes back to Egypt, and he says, what we need to do is to take back the power in this world from the West, which is capitalist, and from the East, which is communist. By this point, we're talking about the 40s. We need to take back the power from the world. How do we do that? By following Allah. We need to follow the Quran to a T. We need to follow the Hadith. These were the founding principles of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. And this man was the primary intellectual of the Muslim Brotherhood coming into the 40s and 50s. Let me repeat that. The founding principle of the Muslim Brotherhood is to follow Islam. Follow the Quran, follow the Hadith, because nobody else seems to be doing it. His principle, his emphasis, is what then has launched what I call the Islamic Reformation. Muslims who try their absolute best to return to the Hadith and the Quran. That is the primary statement of groups like Boko Haram, which, by the way, the Arabic term for Boko Haram actually means uh, the organization of those who wish to propagate the teachings of the Prophet. These are the founding teachings of ISIS, which has broken away from Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, of course, from uh, Osama bin Laden's efforts. Osama bin Laden gave a whole interview in 1999 saying, we're coming after you, United States, because you have suppressed Muslims in the East. We are doing this for the sake of our faith. And now, of course, we see ISIS able to radicalize people based on what? Now, we don't have to conjecture. We don't have to guess because ISIS puts out glossy magazines made by people trained in the West. Glossy magazines that call other Muslims in the West to become devout fighters, mujahideen, for the battle of the caliphate. And what are they doing in these magazines? They're appealing to young Muslims, particularly young Muslims, and their sensibilities of fighting for the sake of Islam. And they'll quote Muhammad, and they'll quote the Hadith, and they'll be the most consistent in quoting Muhammad and the Hadith. Now, don't get me wrong. Remember, when I was taught that Islam was a religion of peace, we quoted the Hadith too, but we left out whole swaths. We didn't explain them. We kind of ignored them. These guys don't do that. They're willing to take a look at all of it and consistently interpret it, and what they're doing is leaning on centuries of Islamic exegesis to say, look, we always fought. You have fallen away. A lot of people ask me, they say, Nabil, look at, uh, look at what ISIS is doing. They're killing other Muslims. Surely it can't be about religion. Time out. How does that logic work? When they kill other Muslims, they think it's because those Muslims are not following Islam properly. And that's exactly what they say. They say, you are not following the Quran, you are not following the Hadith, you are not representing Islam. And this process of, of calling people non-Muslim is called takfir. It's a very well-established Islamic tradition. So, considering all this, when we take a look at those people who say Islam is a religion of peace, are they lying? Are they lying? No, they're not. They're telling you what they believe. They're telling you what they've been taught. And they believe it in their heart, just like I did. And when we look at people like those fighters for ISIS, who are willing to kill, are they Muslim? Of course they are. Of course they are. They're attempting to follow Islam. They're attempting to follow the Quran and the Hadith in a consistent manner, and I would argue they are amongst the most consistent in doing so. So how do we then interact with Islam? How do we interact with Muslims in the world today? And here's where the rubber meets the road, especially for those of us who are Christian. When my friend David started showing me these traditions in Islam, when I ultimately came to the conclusion, again, it took me three years of studying this stuff, when I came to the conclusion that the historical reality of Islam is actually quite violent, I reached a three-pronged fork in the road. I had three options at that point. Up until then, I tried to deny the violent reality of Islam, but when I realized it was violent, I had a three-pronged fork in the road. Number one, I could leave Islam. I could say, I don't want to follow this violence. I don't want anything to do with it. So I could leave Islam. 
I could be an apostate. Number two, I could become apathetic. I could say, well, sure, this is my religion, but this is not something I want to follow. But I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my culture. So towards Islam, I will be apathetic, but I will maintain my Muslim identity, which is what a lot of Muslims do. Or there was the third option, which was to be radicalized. A lot of people are taking that third option. Over 5,000 of the fighters from ISIS were born and raised in the West. And don't believe the rhetoric that these are people who are uh, unhappy with their lives in the West, that they don't have any jobs or they're upset about what have you. Uh, Studies have shown repeatedly that these are the more educated people. The guy from San Bernardino who killed his colleagues, he had had a bachelor's degree, was making $70,000 a year. It tends to be those who are higher educated who are more willing to leave everything they have to fight for these ideological reasons. Now, does that mean that's their only reason for fighting? No, they might have other reasons for fighting as well. Some of them might think fighting is glamorous. Some of them might be trying to escape from the home. But the one consistent factor in every single one of these radicalization cases is they encountered the teachings of Islam and they decided cognizantly to follow them. So do we let these young Muslims, these are the same Muslims who then have to go and strap bombs to themselves sometimes as teenagers. Do we let these people encounter these traditions by themselves? Here's the problem that I keep seeing with the way we've responded to jihad in the West, is we've responded out of fear. Our primary response, I'm not talking about non-Christians. Right now I'm just addressing Christians because other people, look, if you think your life is going to end the moment your heart stops beating, then I can see why you're afraid because someone can take something from you. But if you're a Christian, no one can take that from you. It doesn't matter if you die because we live for eternity. Our lives on this earth are here for a purpose and this is why Jesus tells us to engage even our enemies. If our enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. If our enemy is thirsty, give them something to drink. Why? Because they need to be transformed. If the other Christians in your church, yeah, they might need your presence too, but they definitely, those who are outside of the church, definitely need your help. If we believe in the Christian faith, if we believe in the gospel, then the needs of the unsaved are infinitely greater than our needs. Do you follow that? And so if you have people who have been taught this message and all of a sudden they're encountering a reality of a violent Islam and they have to choose apostasy, apathy, or radicalization, we ought to be there. We ought to be engaging them in that choice. We ought to be explaining to them, look, you've been taught your whole life that Jesus never claimed to be God. You've been taught your whole life that the Trinity doesn't make any sense. But now that you're encountering this earth-shattering reality about Islam, let me recalibrate what you know about Jesus. And in that moment, we can share with them a better way. That's what happened with me. And that's why I'm suggesting we do this. Now, are there other answers to jihad? Absolutely. Are there non-Christian answers? The book, when I wrote the book, I didn't write it just for Christians. In fact, only the last chapter do I really address Christian themes. The book is for everyone. So if you're wondering, Nabil, I have some secular friends I want to give this book to. Can I give it? Absolutely. And for them, there are answers as well. Number one, we need to tease out between Muslims and Islam. Really need to understand this. Muslims are people, Islam is the system. And we can criticize Islam while loving the people. In fact, those people, again, from a Christian perspective, those people are all image bearers of God. And it behooves us to see them as such. But that doesn't mean we ignore the truth about Islam. So we address the system while loving the people. How do we handle the refugee situation? I'll let some of these questions, I think I've gone over, so I'll let some of these questions be addressed on the mic now. But how do we handle the refugee situation? Again, we distinguish between people and the faith. And the first thing that I think we ought to do is understand what we're trying to do. Are we trying to respond for self-defense? And many people are. Or are we trying to help others? Are we trying to help the innocent people in this country who we don't want to come in harm's way because some terrorists might come through those doors? 
Okay, well, let's make our, our goals clear before we go forward. Answering Jihad, the book, is designed to help us understand the reality of Jihad and the reality of Muslims around the world. And once we have that first step of understanding people versus the system, we can have truth held in tension with compassion, and then we will be able to address these issues through policy. But until we get what's going on, we're in no place to respond to jihad. So let me ask you this, and I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to turn to the Q&A session. What we have right now is unprecedented in human history, really. The internet is doing not just what it did to me, the reason why I encountered all these truths was because of the internet. It's doing the same thing to these other people, such that they're reaching this three-pong fork in the road. You're asking the question, why are people getting radicalized so much these days? It's because they have access to the information. But I'm telling you, that's not the only fork in the road that people are coming to. They're also leaving Islam in unprecedented numbers. And they're also growing nominal and secular in unprecedented numbers. Right now, people are being driven to this crossroads. It is the greatest opportunity we have ever had in human history to reach Muslims with the gospel. 1,400 years have not seen as many converts from Islam to Christianity as the past 14 years. People are encountering the reality of Islam. It started with the Iranians after the clerical revolution in Iran. They said, let's give Sharia its full chance. 20 years later, they say, I want no part of this and Iranian refugees are leaving Iran in droves, and the first thing they do once they get to Australia, once they get to Nauru, once they get to the Philippines, the first thing they often do is find a church and say, tell me about the gospel. Right now, tons of churches in Australia are being run by Iranian pastors. Isn't that ironic? You'll get it later. <laughs> are you willing to be a part of this movement? Do you see this as an opportunity to reach people? Do you see this as a possibility to restore people's hope in the world? Because these people believed with all their heart and they've seen their beliefs come to naught. Are we going to reach out and love our neighbors? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you've given us this opportunity. I wish, Lord, that homes would be restored. I pray, Lord, that lives would be saved. I pray that people would have a better way of life. And we know that you don't bring about evil, God, for the sake of evil. But rather, Lord, you restore the evil that we have done into goodness. And you turn tragedies into joy. If you took the worst thing that happened in human history, the death of your son on the cross, and you made it into the best thing that happened in human history, the salvation for mankind, how much more can you take this tragedy and make it into something glorious? And God, we ask that you would work through us. That we would love Muslims not just to convert them, Lord, we pray that they would come to know you. We pray that they would come to have joy in you. But Lord, may we love them because you love them. Whether or not they convert, Lord, may we open our arms to people and love them and receive them and help restore them. Because you didn't demand everyone that you healed to be converted. But you loved and you preached the good news. We pray that we would do the same. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. I think we have a Q&A session. I really wish that Nabil were a whole lot more passionate. <laughs> yes. Very timely words. And obviously, Dr. Qureshi has raised a number of issues and packed a whole lot into almost 30 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. So here's how the, here's how the Q&A is going to work. We have one microphone in the center of the room, and we ask that you form a line at the microphone. And we also ask that when you ask your question, that you state your question clearly so that everybody can hear. 
And we also ask that you keep your question concise and that you limit yourself, if possible, to one question so that we can answer as many as possible. And then one other quick note of etiquette. At RZIM events, we do tend to prioritize non-Christians. And so we may do a little shuffling to ensure the diversity of the questions. And with that said, don't be shy. I know it's always difficult to ask the first question. So let's skip the first question and ask the second. So there you go. <laughs> Uh, doctor, one of the obstacles to compassion for Muslims, especially the refugees, is yeah, I, I used to work in the intelligence community, and it's a fact that in some of the established refugee communities in Sweden, other countries that took them in from the 90s and earlier, those are really fertile recruiting grounds because those individuals, the children of the second, the second generation, are, are, are more adrift in their cultural sensitivity. They don't really fit in in Europe or America, and they don't really fit in as Muslims. I think that's, I, I don't know, <laughs> how, how do you overcome those? You know, it's a great question. Thank you for asking. And please, everyone, feel free to call me Nabil. Um, when we talk about uh, young people who are searching for their identity, I think that that is you know, something that pretty much all young people do, not to downplay your question, but it is something that all young people do. And that's why I am very emphatically supportive of ministries for reaching out to young people in their teenage years, especially. Um, whether they're in the West or they're in Sweden as refugees, what have you. Uh, but again, this is another reason why I think we ought to actively engage refugees. 4.6 million Syrians have been displaced in the past few years. That's a tremendous number. And the vast majority of us uh, will, you know, like, you know, I'm guilty of this too. I'll flick through Twitter and I'll see pictures of these refugee camps that look like sprawling megalopolises. And I just say, wow, that's unreal. And then I go to the next photo. We ought to be stepping up, we ought to be engaging, and we ought to be letting people know that we're loving in the name of Christ. Now, it's not to say that we have to convert them, but I'm saying I really do believe that ideologies make a difference. And if you have people who are coming from an ideology, whether they know it or not, the foundations of the Islamic ideology are built on violence. And they will encounter that at some point. And if their identity is being reframed in that moment, they might just choose to be radicalized. But if they're encountering another option at that same time, they might go the other way. So you're absolutely right. Th these are very important places where people are doing a lot of thinking and a lot of reframing of their own identity and what their life is worth. But that's why I think they ought to be engaged right then and there, from the very beginning. You know, refugees have been coming to the United States for for decades, Somali refugees, et cetera, especially. In fact, I just, uh, I just got back from England less than 24 hours ago, and the taxi driver was a Somali refugee, and he was telling me about, uh, I was asking him about al-Shabaab in Somalia, and he was saying, you know, well, Islam's a religion of peace. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> we have a conversation coming. Um, but then he was dropping me off at my house, so I didn't, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, the refugees have been coming, and I have friends who have ministries where they're delivering beds I'm talking basic necessities to the refugees, or they're teaching them how to speak English, or they're teaching them how to drive. And that's what they're doing. They're not just smacking them with the gospel and trying to evangelize to them. They're, they're you know, praying to God, they're praising God, they're telling their, their refugee friends how amazing God is, but that's simultaneous to them loving them, and they're not actually just trying to convert them. They're just trying to love them and be themselves. I think that's why Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31 are so powerful. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. Do both at the same time, and I think that impacts people more than anything else. Just for a, a quick reason why I'm not focusing on secular responses right now, I do think there are secular ways to engage. Uh, I think that uh, still, just, you know, these kinds of services without the ideological part can help. The problem is you don't replace a violent ideology with no ideology. No ideology is a vacuum. Something is going to go there. And that's why I don't think secularism offers a robust response to Islam. And I'm not alone in this. Of course, Richard Dawkins has agreed. <laughs> it's not often that Richard and I agree. <laughs> uh, but on this one, we do. Uh, and he sees Christianity as a bulwark, a response to violent extremist Islam. And I think he's right. Uh, because Belief in God is hardwired into us, and Muslims have that. 
uh, and, and to, to try to re replace it with nothing. Although some people are getting disillusioned and they're becoming apostates and they don't know what to fill that with, I don't think it will work for the kinds who are predisposed to radicalization. They're the ones who are passionate for their God. And we need to give them the truth about God to be passionate for. But yes, I, I, all that to say, I agree with what you're saying and that's why we have to engage refugees immediately and, and all those who come from Middle Eastern places um, who, who have been unsettled in such a, 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 a traumatic way, we should engage them with love immediately. Thanks. Thank uh, my question is about engaging Muslims in our neighborhoods. Um, I've heard someone at, at a church that I know about say, uh, I would never let a Muslim in my home because of taqiyya. You can't trust them, and I would never know who to trust. So I, wouldn't, I have to protect my family. Okay. Then I have a Muslim family in my neighborhood that I've talked to over the years, and I know the father, and I'm wondering, as I'm talking with the mother, is it appropriate for me to give her like a DVD of, of the Jesus, of Magdala, the Jesus film? Um, or should I let him know sh that I have something for the family? Well, how do you do this when you're speaking with the woman more than the, f you know, I, he knows me too, you know? I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm really glad you're asking these kinds of questions because it shows that you're actually into it. Now, did you go to the uh, Crescent Project training seminar for, okay, good. So they will have, you know, much more specifics to give you. Uh, what I would say briefly is that if you are a woman, you have a, uh, a door into a Muslim home unlike any man could ever have. Uh, because in that Muslim home, the mother and her children are usually under the domain of females. Right? The husbands and elder men are kind of in one area, and then the women and children are kind of in another. And men can't access that, and I'm not sure they should anyway. Uh, but women can. Um, so usually, and again, this is not standard, so it's different for everyone. But from what I've seen, usually, uh, if you just share out of love, and you share with humility, and you just say, you know, you just repeatedly sort of, you know, this is all new to me. I, I thank you so much for being in my home. or Thank you for allowing me in your home. If I make any mistakes, please let me know. I don't want to do anything. Let that be known to everyone. And then do whatever the Holy Spirit calls you to do. <laughs> and uh, there, there should be, if they believe you, and usually a heart that's sincere can be seen, uh, unless there's a lot of depravity in the situation that's going on, a lot of twisted sort of things, which sometimes do happen, but usually a sincere heart will be understood by other sincere hearts. Uh, and so I would go ahead. Um, I've seen a lot of Muslims. Who, I remember um, seeing two former Muslims who were Kurdish. Um, and there's three apparently Kurdish languages. You know, even though they're Kurdish, there's three. Um, and uh, they had become Christians ultimately, but while they were still Muslims, someone had given them the DVD, uh, the Jesus film. Um, and the person had been extremely nervous. Do I give these people a Jesus film? How are they going to receive it? You know, that was, they were the most excited they had ever been when they received this film. And why? The language. The language. They had never seen a movie in their own language. Mm -hmm. And so they received it. They watched it. They showed it to everyone they knew while they were still Muslim. <laughs> this the story. So just, just do what the Lord is calling you to do. Um, there's only so, much you can, only so much that will happen if you make a misstep. And the, the gains far outweigh the losses. So pray. And by the way, this is again a, a basic principle I would like to give to all the Christians in the room. Is before you talk to anyone about Jesus, talk to Jesus about them. <laughs> right? Just pray. Ask the Lord to, to lead and guide as you talk to them. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. This may piggyback a little bit too much on the first question. But you said in your speech that you, we should differentiate between the people and the faith or the religion, and we're talking about the refugees. I can do that here. I can do that in my home, in my comfort, and I can love them as God would want me to love them here. How do we as a country do what you said to differentiate between the people and the faith? to open up our doors because of our love for the people here more than anything Now, else. I think that's one that's easier to address than the answer of how do we get you know, our country to love violent Muslims. That's a hard one. Uh, this one's a bit easier. I think we need to reclaim the rhetoric. Um, Christians have been a bit reactive. We wait for things to go wrong and then we do damage control. Um, and we try to sweep up the mess. 
Uh, and part of what has happened is that in the battles to give certain people certain rights, and I'm talking about not one issue, but many issues, um, we've, we've conflated arguing against uh, a point with hating the people who espouse that point. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So if you, for, if, someone, you know, if you disagree with someone, the way that the rhetoric is, is portraying that is as if you hate them. And once again, I think we as Christians have to take a stand and love people that we actively disagree with. Because only then will people realize we actually are teasing between the two. We're not doing this out of hatefulness towards them. And this is a large part of the reason why um, folks who are um, you know, more compassionate towards, uh, towards the Muslim cause will say, well, everything you're doing is Islamophobic. If you argue against, if you say jihad is violent, you're an Islamophobe. If you're saying Islam is not a religion of peace, you're an Islamophobe. The reason why is because they're trying to conflate the issue of what you say with the people who espouse that position. We need to tease that out. And I think we need to actively tease that out. We have to voice it. And we have to show it. So, if you are willing to say that Islam is not a religion of peace, it would be far better if you did that while reaching out to Muslim refugees. If you're willing to take a stand against Islam, do it while loving Muslims. So people can see, look, it's it's not a conflation here. And I think hopefully over time that will catch traction for our nation. But we have to be the element of change we wish to see. It's just the way it is. no No matter what we do, we have to be that element of change. And so if we as Christians could just gather as a church and say, we're going to love people we actively disagree with, which is what Jesus called us to do. But if we just did that, I think what you're saying would happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, My question, um, when you look, I read your book, and the old, you know, the old, you know, the question of Old Testament and, you know, New Testament and how it relates to jihad. Some people argue that jihad is more in line with the Old Testament and so on and so forth. But my question is more or less, um, this is a question that was raised to me, and I would really like to know how to answer from someone asking this from a Muslim background in terms of how they think, who they are. But I read what you said, and you have, you know, there is a difference between jihad and biblical warfare. Uh, But for me, you have, there's still the difficulty of God told people to kill these others. But yet, in the New Testament, Christians are not, you know, turn the other cheek. Which my question, and this is from how would you, you know, an Islamic person ask this question, but more or less, my question is when you take the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, and we believe him to be the same God, is he not morally relativistic in that things are wrong for this, you know, these, these people, but right for these people, you know, I mean, just relativism as a whole, you know, you shall not eat meat, which for some eating that meat was sin, but then now these things are allowed and permissible. Or you, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, and then Jesus says. Yeah, I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from, and I wrestled with that as well when I was a Muslim, and so I, I, I hope I'll be able to give you what you're asking for. Um, the first thing I want to say is some of those laws were identity laws. They were laws to set the Jews apart from everyone else. So when, you, when God says, you know, do not eat shellfish or do not eat pork, um, it's not that there's something inherently evil about pork. It's that God is setting apart his people. He's making them holy. That's what holy means, to be set apart. That's what the circumcision, the sign of the covenant, was important for. He was setting apart his people. Uh, and so there's a lot of setting apart throughout the Old Testament. You know, the Holy of Holies, why was it different from, you know, the Holies? Well, it was because of the curtain, the, the veil, it was set apart. Uh, the tabernacle, it had a holy part. I mean, there's, there's a lot of setting apart going on because that's how God distinguishes kind of his place or his people. So I'm just clarifying, there's nothing morally wrong about eating pork ever. Yeah. Um, even in the Old Testament time for the Jews, the only reason it would be morally wrong is if they agreed not to do it and then they did it because then they're breaking a covenant. So that's, and that's the other thing I want to share with you is that there is a covenant involved here. So God's doing throughout the Old Testament, he's giving people different covenants to partake in. 
right? If, if we've ever eaten of fruit, we didn't disobey God when he said, do not eat from the fruit of this tree, right? That was a covenant for Adam and Eve. Uh, for no other covenant was, if you build this boat and you get your people on it, I will save you. For Moses, or for a Abraham, the covenant was, leave this land and go where I tell you, and then I will give you, you know, your, I'll give your offspring a land of their own. Those were all covenants that we didn't take part in. And then same with the covenant that Moses had with, with the Lord and the people that followed him. He had a specific covenant. And then we see, for example, in Jeremiah 31, I believe it is. If it's not 31, it's Jeremiah 33, where God says, I will make a new covenant with you. And, your laws, and the laws for them will not be written on paper, but will be written on their heart. So God says, okay, I've had all these covenants. There's going to be one lasting covenant for my people. Uh, and that's the one that we find quoted in the book of Hebrews, saying this is that new covenant. So let's tease out these issues here. We have different covenants for different people. We have some things in those covenants that are not moral imperatives, but sort of ceremonial imperatives. But the last thing I want to get at the heart of your question, though, which is that, look, the God of the Old Testament looks different from the God of the New Testament. How do we explain this? Uh, my daughter uh, is currently seven months old. Um, she is very soon going to learn the word no, and I have no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> but I will have to discipline her. I will have to, and I don't know how to do it. She's so cute. But I'm going to have to discipline her at some point. And I'm going to have to set rules and boundaries and maybe even punish. I don't know yet. My wife and I hadn't had the spanking conversation yet. Are we going to spank? Are we going to do time out? I don't know yet. But we're going to have to figure out how to do that. Whatever we decide, though, I guarantee you we're not going to be doing it to her when she's 20. If we decide to spank her now, I guarantee you I'm not going to spank her when she's 20. Yeah. And it's not because I've changed, it's because she's grown. And so when the God of the Old Testament sets these boundaries and these rules around the Hebrews, he's establishing very foundational principles for them. Look, there is one God. And look, you have to keep that one God holy. You have to keep your covenant relationships holy. Once that's finally established, and we see that finally happen, such that the Jews are, they, at first, you know, they were, they were, you know, worshiping Molech at times, or Baal, and they were sacrificing their children. Finally, they get to a point where they treat God as so holy that they're not even going to utter his name. Forget Yahweh. Instead of Yahweh, they, 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 don't, they started saying Jehovah, and then they said, that's so holy, we can't say Jehovah, so they started saying Adonai. That's how holy they treated God. They, they made him really holy. And guess what? It was then that God says, okay, you've got this. Now I'm going to come. Before, you might have thought that there were multiple gods, but now I'm going to reveal to you that there is one triune God. So now I'm going to come. It's because the people had grown, not because the God had changed. Does that make sense? A bit. Uh, yeah, a bit. Okay. Start with that, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. <laughs> hey, I just want to say I really appreciate your audio book, and I listened to that, and I just thought it was really profound. And Thanks. This is more of a personal question, but um, 10 plus years of being a believer, what's it been like interacting with your immediate family and extended family? And have you seen any progress or see them come to Christ in any way? It's, uh, well, the first seven years were extremely difficult. Um, right before Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus came out, uh, Dr. Zacharias met my father. It was the first time uh, that my Christian life kind of interacted with my, my former Muslim life. Uh, so I was on pins and needles the whole night. Um, like, what's he gonna do, what's he gonna do? <laughs> and um, at the end of the night, uh, you know, Dr. Zacharias basically said, we love your son, he's a great guy, we're taking care of him, uh, we appreciate you raising a good son. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, my dad, uh, when, when we had left, he said, uh, he said, Ravi's a decent man. God. <laughs> Praise God. Um, and then uh, shortly after that, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus came out. And I thought that was going to devastate our family. I was thinking, okay, the little bit of reparation that just happened is going to be destroyed. Um, but the exact opposite happened. And I couldn't figure out why. Because my parents were really upset when the book came out. Even though they knew it was going to come out, they were really upset because I had aired our family's, you know, kind of inside story. That's a very shameful thing to do in our culture. So I thought it, they were going to be very upset. But what started happening was I started receiving prayers from people all over the world. Tens, then hundreds, and then thousands of people saying they're praying for my family. It's the only way I can explain what happened. 
because at that point we started growing closer together as a family again. Mm. And then um, this past uh, summer when my daughter was born, um, I said, you have to come out. She's your, she's your granddaughter. And they're like, no, we can't, we can't. And they were just refusing. You have to, you have to. And my dad says, well, and I had Delta's website open. And so as soon as he said, well, I clicked purchase. <laughs> like it's done. <laughs> and so they came to see, uh, they came to see our daughter and uh, things have been getting better. But it took, it took the better part of 10 years for that to happen. Awesome. Well, I'll be praying for more dreams to come. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Hello. Hi. Um, I work in a church that prioritizes in ministering to Muslims. And we're going through different approaches right now. One of them is called like the kingdom circles. Have you heard of that approach? What's, how, what, what's it's the like angle? the kingdom of God and then the Christian religion and the Muslim religion. You don't have to convert to Christianity. You can go directly into the kingdom and say, I'm a Muslim who follows Christ. Um, yeah. And it's something I understand the compassion behind it, as you said, but it's something that concerns me because I, my, my family converted from Hinduism, so we gave up everything. But it, within the kingdom circles, you can remain in your culture and you can still practice your beliefs while still following Christ. I, and, and I appreciate your concern. I think it's well placed. Um, there, this is a little bit more complicated than that though, um, because what they're essentially trying to do, and, and broadly speaking, this, this movement has been called the insider movement. Um, and before I forget, there's a book written on this issue. It's called Chrislam. Um, the, the first portion of it is written by people in the insider movement, and it's arguing their perspective, and the rest of it's a response. So it has both sides in it. I think it's a very unique book in that, but the majority of it is a response. Here's the issue. People will say, Muslims are already monotheists, right? Didn't Paul say in the Areopagus that that God you worship, not knowing who he is, let me proclaim him to you. And so, uh, you know, if he's saying that to polytheists who are worshiping a God, that that is the right God, why can't we say that to Muslims? That's kind of part of the heart behind it. Another part of the heart behind it is um, that uh, Muslims, generally speaking, once they become Christians, they are ruptured from their community and you can spend, and many missionaries have, spent decades in Islamic areas with one or two converts because once they became converted, uh, they, they were ruptured from the community and they couldn't then uh, propagate that conversion. So they think, how much can we leave their, these new Christians in their community? What can we do, what can we compromise in order to allow these people to stay in that community? I'm not using the word compromise negatively there. Because God, when he came into this world, we have to remember this, when God came into this world, he contextualized himself. I mean, we can never lower ourselves as much as God lowered himself and came off the throne onto this earth, took on flesh. Um, and so, can't we contextualize ourselves the way God contextualized himself and to what extent can we do that? That's the question uh, behind this movement. Now, uh, do I think Muslims uh, who become Christian have to start putting on suits and going to Sunday school and sitting in pews? Uh, no. Um, can they still, you know, if, if they're used to sitting on the ground or however, can they? Yeah, of course they can. Uh, so, of course, there's a degree of Western tradition as well. I'm going to cut to the chase. I've written a blog article on this. You can read that. Um, just type in Nabil Qureshi, Insider Movement, and it'll come up. But the point is this. We have some non-negotiables in the Christian faith. They are the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus. Of course, in the corollary, things that come with that, belief in, in one God, the God of the Old Testament, belief in the scriptures, all that. But the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus stand at the core. The issue is, when, when Muslims consider Christianity, the hardest thing for them to say is that Jesus is God. They'll be willing to say, Jesus is my Lord, you know, if, if they're, they're in this kind of movement, they, they might be willing to say, Jesus is my Lord, but they won't say, Jesus is God. It's too difficult for them. Unfortunately, that's one of our non-negotiables. We cannot give that up. A gospel without the deity of Christ is an eviscerated gospel. The whole message is that God was willing to lower himself, that God was the one who paid for our sins, that God was the one who loved us even though we could never do anything for him. That is the impetus why we then go and love people who could never do anything for us. 
That's the impetus why we then love people who might sin against us, just as God loved us when we sinned against him. So unless you have the deity of Christ in the message, it's not the gospel. That's what I say. And that's why I think these movements are extremely dangerous. Now, if these movements take you up to a certain point, and they say, we got these, we got these uh, people introduced to Jesus, and now they're following Christ, that last step is left to convert them. If that's what they said, I'm on board. Mm-hmm. Hey, you're introducing them. This is part one of a two, two-step process. But if they say, mission accomplished, before they have confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, they're disobeying the gospel, and I think we're doing a very dangerous work. Does that make sense? Yes. Check out Chris Lam, so though. So they don't have to... Confession isn't necessary. I know, I see. Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. But you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. People might say, well, what if that costs them their family? Uh, Well, Matthew 10 says exactly that. It says, if you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. Mm -hmm. And the verses right after that say what? Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. That's not a happy message. It's not a happy image. Picking up your cross and following Jesus. That's what he calls us to do, though. What does Mark 10, 29 say? Mark 10, 29 says, he who gives up mother or brother or father or sister or crops and fields for the sake of the gospel will not fail to receive many more in this life along with persecutions. That's what the gospel expects of us. So that's why I think this message is is missing out some of the greatest blessings of sharing the gospel with people, to tie themselves to their Lord Mm -hmm. by suffering for him. I hope that helps. Thanks. All right. Hello. Thank you for sharing. Um, This is also kind of a personal question that was lightly touched in another one. Um, But I'm wondering, uh, less of Islam as a reflection of Muhammad, but rather of one um, of Allah, how did you personally reconcile that if Islam... Uh, is a violent religion. How did you reconcile that when you came to Christianity and saw that God is a vengeful God? A God is what? A uh, vengeful. Unpack that a bit more. If oh, you oh, like a God punishes wickedness, um, that uh, he hates sin, and uh, the, I guess uh, the actions of the Old Testament where warfare is a plus. Yeah, and that's a great question. I think that goes along with what uh, the young gentleman was saying earlier as well. Um, I never say that just because God used violence, that means we can't follow him. I don't say that now. I don't say that about Muslims. I don't say that about Christians. I don't say that about Jews. Now, I love the fact that in the New Testament, there is no violence whatsoever, Um, unless you're considering kind of eschatological violence. But people are not called to kill one another at all. In fact, in a moment when Jesus could have defended himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark 14, right? What does he say to Peter? put away your sword. Well, I guess he says that in Matthew. He says, put away your sword. Those who uh, live by the sword die by the sword. So there is no violence. What's, Jesus is never depicted carrying a sword. He never tells anyone to fight. In fact, he stops people from fighting. Let's get that clear on the New Testament side of things first. Uh, some people will say that the temple scene was violent. It was not. Uh, Jesus did not strike any person. He struck sheep and cattle, but he didn't strike a person. Um, So there's no violence that Jesus espouses or tells us to espouse in the New Testament whatsoever. When we're talking about the Old Testament, though, can God legitimately use people for judgment? Now, here's what I want to draw our attention to. The young man had said he had read the book. That's why I didn't quote this again. But in answering jihad, I point out people's attention to Deuteronomy chapter 9 and Deuteronomy chapter 11. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 and chapter 11, God says, don't you Jews for a second think that you are fighting those people because you're better than them. He says, don't think that for a second. It's not because you're better than them that you're fighting them, but it's because of their sins that I've ordered this to happen to them. So he makes that abundantly clear. It's like these people are being judged. And we saw that in Genesis chapter 15. When God was making his covenant with Abraham, God says to Abraham, look, for four generations in that time, that meant 400 years, your people will be in captivity while these people are still in that country. But after 400 years, when the sin of the Amorites is complete, then your descendants will take that land. So what is he waiting for? What is God waiting for during Genesis 15 when he says there will be 400 years? He makes it very explicit. It is for their sin, the people who live there, to come to a point of no return. And once that happens, God will judge them. In this case, how does he judge them? He judges them through people. So there's a human agent of God's judgment. 
That we do see in the New Testament. But what do we see? God himself becomes the judgment. God himself becomes the human instrument of judgment. So whereas instead of using the Israelites to then go and and commit judgment upon people, God becomes a human and he is the human instrument of judgment and salvation for everyone. He takes that wrath upon himself. Once again, continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So really the question comes down to this, and by the way, we have these discussions in our, in our meeting all the time, and I tend to see it very, and I, everyone looks at me and they say, Nabil, it's because you're a former Muslim that you're okay with this violence. I'm like, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not true. Um, God, God, has, God has the right to do whatever he wants. And I guess that is a Muslim phrase, in Allah, la kulli shayin qadir, is not he able to do anything that he wishes? Uh, of course, Christians believe that as well. But what he wishes is grace. What he wishes is love. He wishes for everyone to be saved. In the Old Testament, okay, here's, here's another one that uh, I will share with people on occasion. And I, I, I saw this because I was in the medical field. And if you see a person who has a cancer, now it doesn't matter how beautiful life is, I, I move to tears whenever I study the human body. I move to tears when I study molecular biology, which is maybe crazy, but I just find it so beautiful that God can do so much through these, you know, th- through these molecules, and that he can move things in and out and control what comes in and out of cells, and the DNA replication, and everything's mind-blowingly complex and beautiful. But if a cell has cancer in it, you better believe we need to take it out. We need to kill that cell. We need to get it out of that body. Otherwise, it will destroy the whole body. And so it's out of love for that body that we're willing to remove that cancer, even though it's a beautiful cell itself. And what is cancer, by the way? Cancer is just uncontrolled cellular growth. So it's growth. Growth is a beautiful thing, but this is going to destroy the body. That's what happened in Noah's time, is the cancer of sin had taken over virtually everyone. And so God had to reset. Otherwise, humanity would be destroyed. That's what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. God said, yes, even if there are 10 people, I can turn the city around. But there weren't 10 people. That cancer had taken it over. And I think what was happening in the Canaanite lands is the same thing. If God had left those people there, it would have destroyed everyone. And so being the good surgeon that he is, he excised and, and I think, you know, and people say to me, Nabil, that's not nearly as, as powerful an image as you think. I think it is. I think God saved, I think God saved us, and he had to do a little surgical work. Um, it's tragic, it's sad, but that doesn't mean, for example, if people will point to the children who were killed um, and the animals that were killed. Some people like Paul Copan uh, argue that that language is metaphorical language, which people used in those areas and places. And there's reason to believe that. But even if it weren't, for a moment, This life, we have to remember, is not the end. And so those children, how did God judge them? I don't know. I don't know. But we can't say that God just, you know, ended everything for them. No, their lives are eternal. Everyone's lives are eternal. Does that make sense? So there's lots of ways to look at this. What we need to make sure we do is we we don't just imbue it all with emotion and deal with the emotional stuff because that we can never get past um, unless we remember one thing. One last thing, and then we'll go on to the next question. If God doesn't exist, and if God, is not, if God is not a God of love, then love is a fleeting feeling and nothing more. See, if God is love, like our triune God is, there's three persons in the triune God, and so those three persons love each other. They always have. Love is eternal because our God is triune. That's why love is real. And so when we take a look at children who are dying and we we say, does not God love them? Maybe God doesn't exist. What you're doing is if you take God out of the picture, you've taken love out of the picture too. Because otherwise what we feel for people is just chemicals, our body reacting chemically, unless God exists. So much more to say about this, but I hope that, again, this is a foundation for for the two of you. Thank you. Thank you. I get the message, Cameron. <laughs> Hi, Nabil. Good hey. evening. Um, I just want to start quickly by saying I'm from a Christian family. I would never um, deny that there's um, the problem of Islamist extremism all over the world. You know, my father is from Pakistan. My mother was a ethnic Chinese from the Philippines. And all three of those countries have had instances 
of extremism. Mm. Um, but in my own personal experience, uh, I studied abroad in um, Hong Kong and I spent a lot of time in Singapore. And when people talk about the problems of uh, these um, Muslim majority countries, I always have uh, difficulties because I think about Indonesia, I think about Malaysia. And I just want to know in your own research, how has um, the culture of Islam in Southeast Asia differed from the culture of Islam in the Middle East or in Central Asia or in North Africa? That's a great question. Um, and what I would suggest for you if you haven't read it is Keith Swartley's Encountering the World of Islam. It's a big book and it mm -hmm. kind of discusses Islam in various regions of the world uh, from uh, a missiological perspective primarily, um, but it's worth reading that. Uh, Islam is very different in different cultures. So for example, if you go to Bosnia, um, you will run into many Serbian Muslims, uh, but a lot of them are Sufi. Um, if you go to uh, you know, Morocco, you'll run into a bunch of uh, Shafi Muslims um, or Maliki Muslims in various places. And then if you go to uh, uh, you know, Iran, you'll run into Shia Muslims. And each of these different groups of Muslims has a different view. Uh, part of what's been concerning for some is, that, is the Shia view of eschatology. And also this is ISIS's view of eschatology. Different, of course, because there's an imam involved in the Shia view. But there's a notion of sort of ushering in the end times. Uh, by the way, that's what ISIS is trying to do. Um, they're trying to pick a fight with the world. When you see what they're doing, you think, why are they doing what Because they're trying to pick a fight. They're waiting for people to start bombing the first place they took over, which was called Dabek, um, which is where they believe uh, Armageddon will start. And that's what they're trying to usher in. And that's why they named their magazine Dabek. So that's what they're trying to do. Muslims in different places are doing different things. Um, so, you know, Bosnian Muslims, very different from Arab Muslims. Arab Muslims tend to be more traditionalist, mostly Sunni for the most part. Um, whereas you have uh, Indonesian Muslims, of course, are mostly Sunni as well. But their, their Islam has been uh, sort of involved in local cultural traditions too. And Islam, at a certain point, became such a religion that it embraced local traditions, specifically because of the work of Ibn Arabi in the classical era of Islam. He, he made Islam much more universalizable. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but the, the Sunni Muslims of the Middle East, for the most part, uh, ever since the, the, tr the trend to go more traditional, they look much more like Muhammad and the Hadith. And that's why you have um, what I, again, call the Islamic Reformation, this push towards making Islam like the Islam of the Quran in Muhammad's life. But that's not the case in many other parts of the world. So one last thing I would say to you um, is that uh, we as Protestants, I don't know what your background is, you don't have to tell me, but for most of us who are here are Protestants, we're in a Protestant church, we tend to think in terms of sola scriptura, right? We tend to think in terms of the Bible is where we get our doctrine. Most Christians in the world aren't like that, again, because Catholics don't believe in sola scriptura, and virtually no Muslims in the world are like that. There is a very small contingent called Qur'ani Muslims, uh, but the vast majority of Muslims have the Quran and these traditions. A lot of these traditions are based on the traditions of Muhammad, yes, but they've grown over the years such that you have an edifice on top of the Quran. Uh, and so that edifice looks different for different Muslims. For my sect of Islam, it, there was much more of a focus on peace and dialogue uh, and, and proselytizing. For other traditions, like Sufi, there's much more of a mystical focus in that edifice. So after many, many years, these traditions have built up and they look different for different people. Uh, but if you just want sort of a broad sweep, you've got Sunni and Shia Islam. Sunni Muslims, uh, approximately 80% of the Muslims in the world. Shia, approximately 10 to 15%. And you have five branches, of, uh, I'm sorry, four schools of thoughts in Sunni Islam, and they all differ slightly. Uh, for example, what do you do to get divorced, or can a woman be married with or without her permission? Um, those kinds of questions within Sharia are different in those four schools. Uh, but for the most part, they all agree, like all of them agree, that if you're a Muslim and you leave Islam, you have to be killed for it. So the law of apostasy applies to all four schools of Sunni thought and Shia thought. So these are kind of the variations within Islam. But I would suggest you read Keith Swartley's book, Encountering the World of Islam. Thank you. Thanks. Nabil, thank you. Uh, my question, you know, when I was converted, I was loved into the kingdom. Hmm. So how do you compare the love and grace of Christ, especially the grace the Apostle Paul experienced versus the love and grace of Allah? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm glad we get to end on this note. Um, in the Quran, there's actually many more proclamations of whom Allah does not love 
than those whom he does love. So there's a big emphasis on Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love those who do this or those who do that. Um, very irregularly do we see Allah loves those who, uh, by comparison. Uh, in Islam, Allah is more or less unknowable. Chapter 48 of the Quran says that uh, it is not proper for people to know Allah. He remains as if it were behind a veil. Uh, and so how do Muslims encounter Allah then? Usually speaking, they, they don't take communion. They haven't pulled the, you know, the veil hasn't been torn. Uh, we as Christians take for granted our communion with the Lord. Uh, lots of people don't feel like they have that. So what Muslims are often told to do is to encounter Allah through the Quran, learn the 99 names and reflect on them. And so there's 99 epithets in the Quran, actually there's more, but they call it the 99 names because that's a good number. Uh, 99 epithets in the Quran reflect on those. Well, one of them is called al-wadud, which means the loving. But it actually doesn't mean the loving, it means the affectionate. But that's the closest one they get to a loving God. The verse, which actually, the word for uh, love is hub in Arabic. And where do we see that word used? Look at chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran tells Muslims to rebuke Jews and Christians. Why? Because Jews and Christians say we are the beloved children of God. That's where the word hub is used. And the response Muslims are supposed to give to them is, you're not beloved of God. God punishes you just like he punishes everyone else. You're just one of his creatures. And they're not lifting Muslims above Jews and Christians. He's just saying God does not love people like that. That's what chapter 5, verse 18 of the Quran teaches. By contrast, what I mentioned before in the Christian faith, God is not a monadic God. He's not one person, one being. If he were, he couldn't be love. Does this make sense? Because he would have had to create the world first in order to have something to love. But as it was, God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing eternally. And so how did he interact? How did God interact among these persons with love? And love has always existed. That is the undergirding principle of God in the Christian faith is love. This is why 1 John can say God is love. And it was out of that love that he created this world. And it's out of that love that he keeps walking in it and restoring it. Again, Islam doesn't teach that. But in the Christian faith, we see God walking with Adam in the garden. We see God showing up to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre. We see God wrestling with Jacob. We see God dining with the elders of Israel, leading the Jews in a pillar of fire and coming in and dwelling in a tabernacle. And then finally he says that I will come as a child born to you. Every single time he did this, it was to restore people and to introduce his love into this hateful world. And the message of his love is what we are called to give to this world. And this is why the greatest commandment is what? Do what to the Lord your God? Love the Lord your God with all heart, soul, mind, strength. And do what to your neighbors? Love your neighbors as yourself. Why, are, why the emphasis on love, love, love? Because we're made in the image of a God who is love. And that's why we all yearn for love. And that's why this universe needs the love of God, which we are here to give to it. So thanks for your question. I'm just going to end by saying this. On that note, you are here. You are alive now for no other reason than to know God and make him known. And you will know God for all of eternity. If you're Christian and you've received what God has done on the cross for you, you will know God for all eternity. Are you with me? Because the message is eternal salvation for those who receive the work of Christ and have faith in him after having repented. But only for this short period of time when we're alive, this short blink of an eye that we're alive, do we have the opportunity to share the gospel and to self-sacrificially love others. The only time we have to suffer for the sake of others, the way God suffered for us, is right now before we die. I tell people that I was trained as a doctor and an evangelist, which means I'll be out of a job when I get to heaven. <laughs> this is the only time we have to heal and to love people who don't know the love of God. Will you avail yourselves of it? Yeah, people are scared because jihad might come to their home mm -hmm. and, and, and that might be the end of life as they know it. But we as Christians have not been given a spirit of fear but a spirit of power and love and self-control.
And we can engage this like no other person can. We can engage the threats like no other group can because we're not worried about our own lives. To live is Christ and to die is gain. We can introduce the love of God. That's why we're here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nabil, and what a wonderful note to end on. As we bring this evening to a close, let me make you aware that Nabil, Dr. Qureshi, will be through those doors. He will be signing books out in the hallway outside of this sanctuary, so he'll be signing copies of his new book, Answering Jihad. I want to make you aware of two opportunities real quickly, and then I'll close us in prayer. If you've been really stirred this evening, and if you've still got more questions, and I'm guessing that there's probably a chance that some of you still have some questions, we can't always get to all of them, we have two fantastic training events at RZIM that are available to you. One of them is the RZIM Summer Institute, and guess where it is? It's right here in Atlanta at Georgia Tech University. Apologize if there's any bulldogs in the room. But right here in the city of Atlanta, we're so thrilled to be involved here locally as well. And this is a recent development for us as a ministry, and so we're thrilled to offer that to you. You'd have access to all the speakers, workshops. It's an intense week of careful study. The other opportunity available to you is called the RZIM Academy. And this is an online training program that we have recently launched. The feedback for this program has been wonderful. And if you're looking behind me, yes, there we are, beautiful images. Again, wonderful testimonials from that. Very intense. Lots of wonderful interaction. And you really delve deeper into the the subject of apologetics. One of the trainers in one of the modules is Nabil Qureshi and other speakers from the ministry as well. So I wanted to make you aware of both of, us, with both of those opportunities. Well, with that said, let me bring us to a close. Let's, uh, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we can dismiss. Father God, thank you so much for the fact that we have not been given a spirit of fear. We look at the world around us, and we see a lot to be afraid of. But Father God, I ask that you would strengthen all of our convictions. For those, of, for those of us who follow you, I ask that you would grant us courage. Grant us the courage to reach out to those who do not believe what we believe. Help us to reach out to Muslim men and women. Help us to distinguish between Muslims as people and the system that they adhere to. It's not always an easy distinction to make, and we need your help. Father God, above all, we ask that you would enable us to follow you steadfastly, even when times become trying, even when we are shaken to our very core. Give us courage. Ultimately, as Nabil reminded us tonight, we have nothing to lose when we follow you. We have everything to gain. And when we love you with all that we are, we are freed by you to love others selflessly. Help us to do that, we pray, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.